This is Border Media Bodies. Um, I want to thank the MFA Art Criticism and Writing, and especially Russet Letterman for helping organize the whole event. Um, my name is Elizabeth Seltzer. I'm curating and moderating this panel. Our faculty advisor, Susan B., sitting right next to me, um, an established painter and editor who was the 2014 recipi recipient of a Guggenheim Fellowship in the Fine Arts. Um, she's had many solo shows um, at AIR Gallery in New York. Um, last spring was um, June to Win, paintings from the early 1980s, curated by Kat Griefen um, in April, which I attended. It was fantastic. Um, <laughs> Susan um, was a co-editor with Mir Shore of Meaning, an anthology of artists' writings, theory, and criticism. Um, with writings from over 100 artists, critics, um, and poets, published by Duke University Press in 2000. She's also the editor of Meaning, a journal of contemporary art issues from 1986 to 1996, and is currently the co-editor of Meaning Online, and the journal celebrated its 25th anniversary in 2011. That's Susan. Mm -hmm. um, I want to say I chose this, I'm going to sit down, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, I chose the title of this panel, Border Media Bodies, as an attempt at a cohesion of the various threads I feel run through um, the work of the panelists sitting here, S uh, specifically the negotiation of borders, both implicit and explicit, um, being necessarily tied to media and mediation, which in turn affects real bodies and space. By border, I'm speaking to the larger idea of the limina, defined as relating to a sensory threshold of being an intermediate state, phase, or condition. This, to a degree, also ex explains my syntactical choice of using backslashes in the title um, as a nod to the tripline quality of threshold in speech. This in-betweenness, I believe, defines to an extent our everyday lives and our constant negotiation between the virtual and concrete, um, the center and the margin, totaling to a disjunction between public and private thought, speech, and experience. These panelists, either through their own work, as with Elizabeth Shores and Or Menorom, um, or through the study of visual artists such as Rafael Lozana Hammer and Misha Cardenas, as with Sierra Rooney and Dorothy Santos, um, pick up and follow these threads. And first, I'm pleased to introduce Or Menoron, um, and we will be screening her video um, for the first 10 minutes of the panel, so we'll turn the lights off as a pre warning. Um, but let me just introduce her. Or Menoram is an artist and recent graduate of the School of the Art Institute of Chicago in the MFA Film, Video, New Media Department. Um, her work, Limited Speech Holds Endless Misunderstandings, which we will screen here in the entirety, was created as part of her thesis work at SAIC. Born in Israel, she received her Bachelor of Fine Arts from Bezalel Academy of Art and Design in Jerusalem in 2010. Limited Speech, which concerns the writer Noam Chomsky's refusal of entry at the border into Israel, has been previously exhibited in her 2013 show, No Control of the Border, at Tel Aviv Museum in Israel. Um, so we'll start there. Before um, screening the video, I'm going to say three words about um, the work and the background for making it. So in 2010, uh, Noam Chomsky, who is a linguist and political activist, was invited to give a talk at Birzeit University near Ramallah. On his way to the talk, he landed in Israel and uh, was identified by the border control officials as radical left uh, and denied entry to the country. And uh, he was put on a plane back to Jordan, where he initially came from, uh, to Israel. Uh, shortly after this incident, Dana Weiss, who is an Israeli news reporter, came to interview him in his hotel lobby in Amman, Jordan. And during this interview, those deep ideological tensions between Chomsky and Dan Weiss surfaced. So in the video that we're about to watch, um, you will see appropriated footage from this interview. And what I was interested in was uh, how appropriation as a technique emphasizes questions that already exist in the original footage questions about borders, power, language, and voice. So we're going to watch the video now. 
it's 10 minutes long. Um, and after that, I'm going to talk a little bit more about the process of making it and working with appropriated footage. Uh, and I think an interesting uh, thing to pay attention to that could relate to the panel later uh, would be the transition from a, um, public space to personal or internal space. I only have a few minutes left to talk and a lot to say. Um, so while making this work, as I mentioned before, I was interested in the question of how appropriation as a technique emphasizes dilemmas that already exist in the original footage and how does Chomsky's deportation um, connect between uh, language, power, speech, borders, and transgression. Um, so to answer these questions, I created this uh, invisible character that's a hybrid of Chomsky and Weiss's voices. And uh, <coughs> to, um, to create these characters' sentences, I used uh, Chomsky's linguistic theory uh, called uh, universal grammar. So I made this video as a response to Chomsky's deportation and I was interested in his uh, theory when I made it, but my intention wasn't to speak for Chomsky or advocate for him and say how poor he is for being deported from Israel, and that's because he's a public figure and he already has a voice and he doesn't need me to do that. What I was interested in was uh, Chomsky's persona and his double role as both a linguist and a political activist. So what happens when I take the voice of someone like Chomsky or like the news interviewer and I use them to say something different? And then uh, who has control over the message of the piece? Who has the voice? Who has the power in the piece? Um, and the editing, the, the chopping and rearrangement of the speech draws attention to the act of editing and to its power. Uh, which leads me to the second and last part of this presentation and a legal controversy that uh, happened in Israel uh, after showing this video. Uh, in December last year, I opened a solo show at uh, the Tel Aviv Museum and uh, the uh, Channel 2, who owns the original copyright for this footage, had issues uh, with the video and the show was shut down. Uh, so I'm currently negotiating with the television channel and hoping to find a solution to be able to show the work again in Israel. It's currently can't be screened in Israel and it's also not available online. Uh, until I find that solution, I think that there is an interesting and perhaps ironic parallel between the content of the work and the experience of exhibiting it. Uh, both of them, in both of them, uh, the practice of appropriation suggests speech uh, as uh, a way to uh, challenge power and the relationships between institutions and the individual. Thank you very much. This is the sound of a popcorn crunch. I'm lying in bed thinking of you. I just got back from the doctors and found out it's a boy. These and thousands of other recorded voice messages were played out of the skyscape of Philadelphia every night between September 20th and October 14th in 2012 as part of uh, Raphael Lozano Hemmer's public project, Open Air. Commissioned by the Association for Public Art, Open Air utilized mobile technology that transformed voice messages into an interactive light show. While the Association for Public Art and the City of Philadelphia heralded the project as a platform for democratic expression, Open Air is perhaps better understood as a visual expression of the dominance of social media, what Brian Masumi terms sociability giganticus. The project mirrors the machinations of social media, conflating the private with the public space of both the web and the urban street. In doing so, Lozano Hammer implicates our culture's need for digital exhibitionism, blowing up the most mundane and the most intimate of expressions of selfhood to monumental scale. Using the free iPhone app or the website openphilly.net, participants of open air could record and upload a voice message up to 30 seconds in length. The messages were then sent to a queue scheduler system for playback. Messages recording on site using the free Wi-Fi network at the Benjamin Franklin Parkway were given priority, 
encouraging people to visit the actual site of the performance. Messages were also sent to a database where participants could listen to and rate the entries. The higher rated messages were given a privileged position in the queue after those recorded on the parkway. At the project control room, uh, a custom design software analyzed the voice messages for frequency, volume, and location. The messages were then translated and played back using 24 powerful robotic searchlights located on the parkway. The beams are directed towards the location of the speaker and responded in brightness and intensity to the individual voice intonation. Each message produced a unique dynamic light formation across the sky, which could be seen up to 10 miles from the parkway. When a message began, the light beams responded instantaneously, swinging across the sky towards the location of the speaker. As the message played, the light beams flickered, the speed and intensity depending on the speaking voice. Voices that were loud and sharp produced staccato flashes, creating an almost flicker-like effect. Quiet voices produced a subtler waving in the brightness of the beam. For those people participating outside of Philadelphia, a digital playback was created and stored on the website. The Benjamin Franklin Parkway, a boulevard that runs through the cultural heart of Philadelphia, is a largely empty space, underutilized by pedestrians, uh, both citizens and tourists alike. Open Air drew an estimated of 17,000 people to the parkway through the run of the project, with almost 63,000 people visiting the website, filling the normally deserted streets with throngs of people. The collective atmosphere was that of a neighborhood block party, as spectators took in the messages in the sky, some scoring uh, the much-coveted seats on couches that were brought in for the performance, uh, while other lay uh, directly on the ground, um, and still others ambled about the parkway grounds. Close to 6,000 messages were recorded in over 20 languages. Taken collectively, they are an audio and visual panorama of voices, both local and global. Individually, they express widely different sentiments. Some messages were comical, as in a public service announcement urging bikers to forgo clothing to make themselves more visible to drivers. Other messages were impersonal shout outs to friends and family. Other people read poems, sang songs, and a surprising number of these messages were personal and emotional. A young girl apologized to her parents for causing their marriage to fall apart by, quote, not being good enough. While another girl recounted her heart uh, being broken just minutes ago. One man proposed to his girlfriend, while another sent a message to his son. Quote, it's been a year since we lost you. We love you very much. Uh, the messages have since been stored on a database and are made available on the project's website. Participants were able to tag their messages by type, mood, and subject. Uh, the messages are searchable on the database from a pull-down menu of tagged keywords. For example, a search with the keywords rant, philosophical, and love produces the message from a man named Greg who wonders who on earth would ask somebody to marry them at open air. <laughs> Lozano Hammer describes his art practice as relational architecture and relation specific, distinguishing it from relational aesthetics and site specific. The grounding of Lozano Hammer's work lay in the particip participation of the public rather than the history of a particular site. In fact, he restages many of his performances in different cities, emphasizing the discrete communities rather than the specificities of any physical location. Moreover, the conception of relational is derived from the neurological studies of Francisco Varela, as well as cross-referencing data platforms where things operate as a network of variables, not hierarchically. He places his practice in the sphere technocracy distinct from the decidedly low-tech interactions characteristics of relational aesthetics championed by Nicholas Beauregard. Open Air utilized the capacity of the internet to offer participants the ability to intervene, even temporarily, in public space. The work reclaims the public sphere as an experiential field, one where participants were able to visualize the effects of their personalized messages within the impersonal architectural space of the city. Rather than dictating or pre-programming the end result, Lozano Hemmer created a platform of experience and interaction. The technology then extended the participants' ability to interact with the brick and mortar cityscape in unexpected ways, squaring firmly with his practice of relational architecture. 
Each light message was a dynamic and visual expression of personalized action. Throughout much of his practice, and specifically in open air, Lozano Hemmer develops a media ecology that generates the possibility for public interaction that is once individual and collective. Yet, open air was not merely abstracted communication in the forms of beam of light. It also included an open archive of the voice messages, and in many ways, the archive is the core of the project. While 17,000 17, people viewed the show on the parkway, over 63,000 people visited the website during the run of the project and has since grown exponentially since then, uh, making the website the dominant interface through which people interacted with the project. The vast majority of viewers then heard the voice messages. The informational content of the communication remained very much intact. The presence of the archive makes open air much more subversive than uplifting. Uh, than the uplifting city-affirming project touted in the promotional literature. It identified participants who left personal voice messages not to close friends or loved ones, but to the public at large. The availability of the messages makes open air a visual allegory for the dominance of social media as a primary mode of expression in contemporary culture. The rise of social media sites such as um, Facebook, Twitter, over the past 10 years has radically altered the division between private and public. The sites not only offer a platform for self-expression, but also actively encourage users to share their personal narratives. Uh, the ubiquitous what's on your mind prompt on the Facebook profile is an invitation to share instantaneous thoughts and opinions. And the recent discontinuance of Twitter's what's happening illustrates just how internalized such prompts have become, making the explication of them redundant. These sites enable individuals to enact a new form of self-expression, one that is both mediated and real-time. The self-constructed narratives created on sites like Facebook, Twitter, and notably on personal blogs turn the web into a vehicle for self-exposure. The sites also allow for interactivity. While an individual is able to share personal information, other users can both view and comment on the content thus fostering the symbiotic relationship of exhibitionism and voyeurism. In Locative Dystopia, Drew Hemmen argues that our age is characterized by, quote, scopophilia, a mix of voyeurism and exhibitionism and an ontological need to be observed. So I want you all to take a moment and imagine a virtual space as a medium for performance art. It shouldn't be too difficult considering many of us perform some version of ourselves through social media networks such as Facebook or Instagram or Twitter. And even language, we use it as to suggest something about our identity or politics on a platform, um, on these aforementioned platforms. But let's take a look at a specific virtual space. Let's look at Second Life. Second Life is a multiplayer on open source virtual platform where users or residents from around the world create avatars and socialize in environments created by, well, by and for other users. Residents are afforded 3D modeling languages through the platform to express themselves in a multitude of ways whether through fashion, body types, and skins, or creating an avatar as another species. Second Life offers its residents a way to create whatever world they want, to see or express themselves however they want to be seen. That may be impossible, obviously, to express in real life. But how can this space be used as a medium for creating performance art? In 2007, artist duo Eva and Franco Metes created a series of synthetic performances called Reenactments. In this specific reenactment of Marina Abramovic and Ule's piece, Imponderabilia, uh, to everyone's left, the duo created digital representations of themselves with a set of instructions for gallery visitors to walk between the two naked avatars. Now, although the duo engage in an artistic practice that is a thought-provoking <laughs> alternative to real-life performance art, I want to share a work that engages in political aesthetics and reimagines gender expression, identity, and representation. 
In the following year, in December 2008, Misha Cardenas executed Becoming Dragon, a 365-hour mixed reality performance in Second Life. So looking a bit more closely at the piece, the image you are looking at is of a darkened computer lab located at the University of California, San Diego. So in the middle of the room, a figure stands bathed in red light. The futuristic eyewear fits snugly around their head, pressing a section of short, wavy hair. The eyes are completely covered, suggesting some kind of exercise in sensory perception and deprivation. To the right and left side of the body, wires stream down to the floor like multiple umbilical cords, networked to the system of devices in the room. They indicate the artist's confinement to the physical space. The two large projection screens behind the artist show rooms in virtual space. The most striking and well-lit portion within the frame shows a mythical creature. The dragon, with its metallic looking skin and glowing features, appears to be looking beyond the frame and into the very room you are looking at. The dragon looks as though it is waiting for the figure on the other side to perform a gesture or a move. The dragon is an avatar, is an electronic representation of the human body that stands in the center of the frame. The performance was done in tandem with Cardenas's real-life gender transition, which served as a parallel meditation on her trans transformation into another body. Gender reassignment surgery requires living for 365 days as the preferred gender expression, as well as undergoing hormone replacement therapy. Before the performance, Cardenas lived for 365 hours, perceiving her environment through motion capture technology and seeing her immediate surroundings through a head-mounted display and real-time video feed. As a part of her documentation, Cardenas stated that the choice of a dragon for an avatar was related to the history of dragons as magical creatures, <coughs> able to shape shift into different forms and teleport through space. Now, in looking at the physical performance space and makeshift living area here, this photograph offers a glimpse into the size and scale. With the visible and multiple tripods and cameras, there's also this suggestion of surveillance on the body. The dimensions of the room also indicate the limited space for which the artist could actually move. On the opening night of Becoming Dragon, <coughs> Cardenas recited some of her poetry for her visitors in both physical and virtual spaces. The bright, almost piercing red light of the motion capture system highlights Cardenas in this photograph in preparation for her transition. The poem that appears here is titled Notes on Psychoneuroendocrinology, and a particularly noteworthy excerpt reads, Sixu said that women must write women's bodies, body as an insurgent act. Can we imagine constructing and shape-shifting as a kind of writing, and therefore, as a kind of insurgency? Well, not only was Becoming Dragon an insurgent act, it also required endurance, which played an integral role in the performance. Although calculated risk is an inevitable, inevitable <coughs> part of the creative process, Medical specialists warn Cardenas not to engage in this particular endeavor due to possible neurological side effects, such as dizziness, disorientation, flashbacks, and psychosis. For approximately seven months, from May to November 2008, she wore the head-mounted display in timed increments that ultimately resulted in her being able to wear the device for up to 15 to 16 hours a day, each day of the performance and the performance lasted for approximately 15 days. That's approximately 365 hours, so 15 days. The suggested use of this type of technology, 15 minutes. The mixed use of technology allowed Cardenas to experience movement, perception, and sensation through machine vision. The experimental performance has also served as a way to test the human body's capacity for change, for physical change and examine the body in transition versus locating specificity to any gender classification. At the intersections of art, science, and technology, 
Cardenas refers to second life as a way to prototype one's body in a way that is impossible to do in physical space. Theorist Gail Solomon extrapolates on the concept of the felt sense in her text, Assuming a Body. She states, the body one feels oneself to have is not necessarily the same body that is delimited by its exterior contours, end quote. Through becoming dragon, Cardenas was able to create a mythical body that represented a variation of the self. Taking into account this notion of multiplicity, the work is also aimed to explore genders outside of male and female binary in an effort to illustrate the wide array of representations the human body could occupy within virtual space. So after contemplating Misha Cardenas' use of augmented and virtual performance, one of the most important considerations that came to mind was how the binary classification of sex and gender's primary defining features perpetuate masculine and feminine gender constructions. From hormone therapy to 3D, to 3D dragon you see here, documentation of the physical elements of the work also remind us of the plasticity of the body. But how can it be subjected to the boundaries and parameters of medicalization in order for it to become a body that is both le legitimized and recognized. The performance also accentuated a blurred sense of time, space, and movement of the subject. But it also prompted the viewer to ponder the location of the subject and whether or not this subject was a fixed entity throughout the viewing experience. The artist encouraged the viewer to consider the manner in which perception itself is mediated by the devices and constructs we choose to carry with us throughout our experiences. As Cardenas occupied various spaces as an effort towards thinking cogently about expressions outside the binary structures of masculine and feminine, the work served as an example of how performance art could serve as a way to affect cultural change. At the time of the work, there was an estimated 15 million registered users, users to Second Life. Through the inherently social nature of the work, the performance was a way to connect with people around the world who may not otherwise engage in such critical and necessary dialogue in real life and regarding this particular topic. So um, as we've already heard, um, I'm a visual artist <clears throat> and I'm based in Albuquerque, New Mexico. I work primarily in FM transmission and audio sound. Um, and in my FM transmission work, I generate uh, uh, radio waves, a form of light, um, as a way to fill space with sonified data. The uh, radio waves penetrate the surface of our bodies and nearby materials, and in doing so create an imperceptible medium, which is activated when we turn our attention to it using a radio receiver. In this way, I use radio transmission to physically inhabit the same location as a public who may not be physically present, while pointing to a liminal zone between something that is beyond our sense perceptions and our physical bodies. I began to use the radio antenna as a hopeful gesture following a visit to the, or to the NRAO Very Large Array, which you see here. Um, and this is antenna number 28, or number 27. And that was in June 2013. Um, I was uh, fortunate enough to get um, a tour inside of one of these radio telescopes. Um, and so once you know, I was briefed on the ways in which the equipment housed in the center of the dish scanned and processed radio waves, um, I climbed inside of the 82-foot diameter dish and uh, recognized that that was the closest that I was probably going to come to physically understanding distant objects that exist in outer space outside of my sense perceptions. So while I laid on my back in the dish of the very large array, uh, antenna number 27, I realized that that antenna stood as a silent monument to the search for connection, a metaphor of the act of reception. While I realized that it's not always the intention of the scientist who's processing the data, I perceive a radio telescope as the embodiment of hope, a symbol not of making a public, but of being one. One-way transmissions of knowledge from powerful elites to an underrepresented or unrecognized public, often with little knowledge of the unique variation of individuals on a local level, often reveals a self-serving bias which may appear incomprehensible to its unwitting audience, 
leading to feelings of disengagement, of fear, apathy. By resorting to metaphors of perception, such as FM radio transmissions, in order to abstractly address this concern, work can be created that is intentionally subtle and may seem to be easily dismissed. Now, in doing so, the intention is not to reward the dismissal, the dismissal of the artwork, but instead to reward a patient, careful observer and simultaneously suggest the importance of generating a public. A public versus the public, as described by critic and professor Michael Warner, is self-selecting and capable of creating a social space. In my work, I intend to reward a public in order to promote the resistance of a mindset that's geared towards personal as opposed to mutual gain. So I wanted to um, show a couple different projects uh, that inspired some of the work that um, uh, I'm going to be showing you guys today. This project, Search, and uh, it was created by Inigo Manilalo Obale in 2001 as part of the Insight 2000 exhibition, um, which is a series of art projects installed in and around the San Diego-Tijuana border. Uh, Man Manlano Ovale transformed the Plaza Monumental uh, Bullfight Ring in Tijuana into a radio telescope, into an actual radio telescope, with a receiving dish and an antenna, which was suspended from above, which you see here. It's kind of hard to see, but it's there. Uh, and, and the receiving dish and the, oh, and, and the ring itself was uh, cleared of all advertisements, of all text, um, uh, flags, everything. Um, so he was really focusing on the site itself. Here he plays with the idea of immigration and alienation. The receiving dish and antenna create feedback um, with one another. And this feedback was then projected using 50, subwoof uh, using 50 subwoofers into the bullfight ring. And it generated both audio and radio waves. And th thus was capable of transmitting sounds received not only from outer space into the surrounding communities, but it was also breaking through the US-Mexico border wall. The signal itself changed constantly. Searching for the signal was impossible. Um, it drifted throughout the FM spectrum. And so um, Manlano Ovale suggests that the gathering of information here was less important. What was more important was the tactics of dissemination. So the public that would find these transmissions were often unwitting participants. Uh, reports of taxi drivers in Tijuana reporting strange alien-like transmissions on their radio were uh, Manlano Ovale's success. That's, that's how he described the success of his work. Another work that I was really inspired by was um, by the Astro Vandalistas Art Collective, um, a Mexican artist collective developed uh, affect lab. Um, it's a way to appropriate urban architecture and environments through the use of technology and networks. Using a, mo a module called LocalNet, which was designed to receive message sent messages sent to Affect Lab and send them to several prototype projects, one of which you see here, the telematic sound weapon, uh, which was installed in 2012 outside the military, uh, military club in Campo Marte uh, on a four by six uh, meter metal structure, which you see here. So the metal structure was already there and uh, the Astro Vandalistas Art Collective installed upon it um, 64 galvanized steel pipes um, with a motor attached to it that sounded every time someone would tweet uh, Bango Campermate on the local net as a protest against violence in the country. Although, wor although the words that were treated by, or that were tweeted, although the words that were tweeted by an unknown public uh, were not vocalized, these loud sounds that were generated by the artist's installation um, amplified Oh, and amplified by the appropriated structure, um, amplified a community that might not be that might not be physically present in that space. So here, the Astro Vandalistas Art Co Collective questions the limits, both both psychological and physical, of collective participation through the use of technology to move virtual protest into physical space, as they say. Here is a different approach to making a public visible, um, which is seen in a work by Neighborhood Public Radio. Um, Neighborhood Public Radio is an artist collective um, consisting of uh, three artists, John Brumitt, Lee Montgomery, and Michael Trujillo. Uh, Neighborhood Public Radio, or NPR, creates sites of potential using FM radio transmission projects and uh, offering an alternative method for people to generate media in public space. Talking Homes, which you see here, 
uh, was a project created uh, and taking place between 2006 and 2009 uh, in and around Oakland, San, Diego, or San Francisco, Detroit, and New York City. FM microtransmitters commonly used for providing information about houses for sale were installed within the private homes of different community members who recorded different stories depending on the particular theme curated by NPR. These stories included the worst neighbors in their neighborhood, what it meant to be a pioneer to them personally, um, and other narratives about communities within cities. Driving tours were offered by the artists both personally and in the form of a downloaded map allowing listeners to use their uh, car radio to, turn into the per to tune into the personal and sometimes intimate recorded stories from the home's inhabitants. So if they would literally drive up to someone's house and tune in and listen to someone's personal story. So, so here you see the Talking Homes unit, which would be broadcasting, and here's an image um, from, inside, from inside someone's car. Mm -hmm. So these and, um, and other transmission projects led to the creation of the Lomas on-site listening station which is a site-specific solar-powered radio station, um, uh, well, yeah, radio station installed within an empty billboard located in Albuquerque, New Mexico. It was created by 20, between 2013 and 2014 by visual artists and Professor Jessamine Lovell and myself. The Lomas on-site listening station uh, was funded by the nonprofit arts organization Friends of the Orphan Signs, which is run by visual artist and Professor Ellen Babcock. The Lomas on-site listening station includes a micro-powered FM transmitter using an Arduino microprocessor code created by artists and professors Lee Montgomery and Connor Peterson. So we started with a site. The site was offered to us um, by um, Ellen Babcock, uh, who I had mentioned earlier. She's the director of the Friends of the Orphan Signs, which is a nonprofit um, artist-run organization in Albuquerque that seeks to appropriate and re-envision the use of abandoned uh, billboards in and around Albuquerque. New Mexico. So we started by, well, we spent a lot of time on the site, but we also wanted to get really close to the sign itself. So this was our sign, and um, we worked with uh, Pat Garcia, um, who generously uh, worked with us to make lots of measurements and uh, detailed plans of the sign and, and really try to understand it. We spent a lot of time just sitting in this empty lot, seeing who's, who goes through here, what's going on. Eventually, we, we came ac across this idea to generate a sign that um, it wasn't a vinyl, like a slick vinyl sign to introduce an image into the environment, but instead we took a compressor microphone and uh, fastened it to the appropriated structure of the abandoned billboard, which you see here. Um, and what ends up happening is that it picks up the ambient sounds of the lot, um, the hum of traffic along the heavily traveled nearby highways, the wind, um, the sounds of passerby, the buses. All of these sounds are broadcast in real time on an FM signal within several thousand feet of the billboard, creating a hyper-local listening station that allows any person to become part of the project if they choose to do so, or even if they choose not to do so. Um, any of you have questions for each other? Um, if not, I'm sure with Susan, I can start as well. But. Do you have questions for each other? Yeah, yeah um, okay. I actually, um, I was wondering, um, with uh, the channel, I think it was channel four that was giving you, giving you a hard time, um, you mentioned that that was happening, and I was curious what the, um, the conversation was with that. Mm -hmm. sure. um, so, unfortunately, I can't talk too much about it, because uh, of, I'm currently negotiating with them. So there's a, a lot of, uh, like it's still going on. Um, but uh, it uh, has to do with the copyright for the work and um, the copyright for the interview and the uh, and clarity that exists around copyright law internationally. Uh, so the way it works is that uh, there's, um, the laws differ from each country and uh, so there's a a question around that, like, um, for example, I am showing the work in the U.S., but in Israel it may be different. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, so uh, a lot of artists, nowadays, the question of working with appropriated footage is a very big question, because mm -hmm. it 
kind of a little bit maybe of Wild West. I think the law is still catching up with the pace that people are doing that. Mm -hmm. A lot of artists are <coughs> using appropriated footage, and so there's no problem unless the wrong person, you know, pays attention. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's um, so it's not it's still not uh, completely clear um, how you know the, how the issue is going to resolve and. Um, I do think it's a, a lot of it is a question of uh, that has to do with uh, you know, allowing um, allowing uh, people to speak and who has the power to use that footage and to make that commentary. Usually, news footage is one of the footages that are most flexible in terms of that it's allowed to use. Uh, so, for example, if I was um, taking uh, an animated character and making a, a movie using that, that would be a different a different issue, but usually there's a lot of flexibility with news footage, but mm -hmm. uh, it's mostly around the issue of copyright mm -hmm. and uh, the fact that it's, there is a, a, a vagueness around the using it internationally, so. Mm -hmm. Mom, any other questions? Could, could you describe or uh, maybe define inversal grammar because you touched upon yeah. it, but then if you yeah. could just tell us what that is. Yeah, definitely. So uh, uh, to compose the sentences of this invisible character in the movie, uh, I was influenced by Chomsky's theory, universal grammar. And uh, this is a theory that's kind of uh, from Chomsky's earlier theory, and I'm definitely not an expert, so if anyone here has like <laughs> corrections, I'm totally accepting it. Uh, he already debunked, I think, this theory himself, so <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but I'll still bring it up. Uh, so <coughs> according to this theory, um, it's talking about the relationship between having language and being human. So Chomsky says that to be human has to do with having language. Mm -hmm. So every person is born with the ability to acquire language. And, um, and that's part of hu being human. And to do that, uh, a person needs two things. He needs a, a vocabulary, which is a collection of words, mm -hmm. and he needs a grammatical rules to put these words together. Mm -hmm. So um, so in, in the work, uh, so and, and in every language, there is a limited amount of words, a limited vocabulary, but there's an endless amount of expressions. So there's an endless amount of ways to put this limited vocabulary together. And to uh, exemplify this theory, Chomsky uses a sentence that's a little bit famous. It's, uh, he says, uh, colorless green clouds sleep furiously, uh, which is kind of a famous quote of his. Mm -hmm. Sounds like it makes no sense at all. Mm -hmm. And that's Chomsky's whole point, that this sentence is grammatically correct. But it is so bizarre that the chances that someone uttered it before Chomsky is zero. Mm. And there is endless sentences like this in every language. So, and actually the title of this piece is based on the sentence colorless green clouds, mm -hmm. uh, sleep furiously, it says limited speech holds endless misunderstandings. Mm -hmm. I use the same logic, only I took words from the vocabulary of the words from the interview. Mm -hmm. So, so in the interview, to make this piece, I, 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 I took apart, I cut the language of the interview into individual words, mm -hmm. and I took those individual words and I made sort of a tool for myself, this dictionary, and uh, then I took words from this dictionary and I put them together as this poem or a monologue that you see at the end. Mm -hmm. And I also used words from this dictionary to make the title. Uh, so that's how it connects to Chomsky's uh, theory. So, yeah. yeah. I have a question. Were people able to interact with uh, Cardenas in that virtual space, and what yes. did that interaction look like? Well, it's interesting because she had, so she would have <coughs> um, people from the university mostly mm -hmm. go to the performance because it was publicized, but it was obviously much more well attended, as you can imagine, in virtual space because it was just people from all over. Mm -hmm. and. So yes, to, to answer the question, it was uh, attended by other avatars. And um, it's interesting because there was a lot of people who were interested, most of the people she found, and there were actual classes. So classes from 
other countries or other cities would actually visit her in Second Life, and then she would lecture to them, but through the dragon avatar. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, I wish I was a part of that because I would have been, I would have really thoroughly enjoyed that. But I think the whole point of her doing it was to speak to this kind of, and I mean, even Gail Solomon talks about in her book, Assuming a Body, that, you know, she takes this from like Merleau Ponty's idea of um, like body auxiliaries. So then, how, how can we extend that through technology? And she just used virtual space and, you know, modeling the avatar as she was uh, performing as well uh, for her audience. Um, does, um, is this piece um, archived somehow? I mean, can one access it? You know, I actually tried to access the work and it was really challenging to do so. And I think that's one of the things that is, even with new media and digital art, it, it can be very uh, difficult because a lot of the technology, I mean, this was 2008. I mean, this is even before the Xbox Connect, which was, I mean, now it's a really sophisticated sensor that there's so many artists that are working with it now, but, um, you can't recreate a lot of that because also, mind you, in the physical room at UC uh, Sa San Diego, she had eight sensor, eight, eight motion detector sensors in a room, but th that's really old technology that's not as, um, you know, there's a lot of technology that's actually caught up that can do the work of these eight sensors now. So it's, uh, it's only in video um, and that's it. But it, in terms of online, I mean, like I said, even when I tried accessing it, it wasn't something that I could easily access. But I know Cardenas herself um, probably has access to actual like live footage of the performances. Um, we can all go up to the floor if anyone has um, burning questions. Uh, or non-burning questions. Or, or, <laughs> or cold questions. Cold. <laughs> or comments. I have a question. Yeah. Um, okay. um, I guess it's for both of you. Uh, you were talking about um, the project of another artist, and you were talking about your own work. But I was wondering if both of you could talk about the interaction of the audience with the work, because I think in both the projects there was like a kind of a, a sub subversive potential. So I wonder if, and you both mentioned that the audience was very engaged, and I wonder if there has ever been an audience that took advantage of the subversive uh, potential of the work and was using to transmit their own messages? Or yeah, I mean, certainly with recording messages, I had it completely open. You could record whenever you want. There was no censorship. Um, so uh, people absolutely did take advantage of that. And the only way to um, sort of mediate that was I had a, a flag, you could flag sort of inappropriate content, but it, it was very much left still available to, to anybody to access it if they wanted to, and it was still very much played out over the skyscape. So some kind of very aggressive, very explicit messages were sort of blown up to absurd uh, proportions in the public space of Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Well, with uh, the Lomas Project, we don't, we don't uh, keep, uh, I guess, any archives of that. Uh, so if somebody was doing that, I wouldn't, I wouldn't know about that um, unless I was uh, out there. Uh, the one, one thing that I think about with the project is that we do leave it on. Uh, it's on day and night. It's designed to, to never turn off. Um, and so it's right next to a major bus stop on that road. There's people who travel through there. And, and sometimes I wonder you know, what, what sorts of things are being picked up. Um, it's mainly picking up ambient sound. So, um, we, had we had talked about using stuff like a parabolic reflector or like very focused audio to get very like clear points around the lot. And ultimately we decided we wanted something a little more ambient. Um, and so if somebody was taking it to, to think of a way of using it for sub subversive potential, um, I'm not sure of that um, at this time. Um, but we did um, also have a conversation about, um, I guess, the wattage of the, the transmitter. Generally, when you are using FM transmission, uh, it's uh, governed by the FEC, right? Uh, the radio waves are, are owned. Um, and so if you are operating at a certain wattage or a certain power level or interrupting signals, um, it's a federal offense. And so we, we decided to make it completely legal. This was funded by you know, a nonprofit organization, and we wanted to, to, to do that. But 
um, a lot of different projects like uh, neighborhood public radio, for example, um, and others uh, intentionally work within a subversive um, realm of interrupting, um, interrupting transmissions as, um, as a political act. Do you have any plans to archive it in any way, or is it just going to exist as a sort of ephemeral, tempered performance? We, we're comfortable with it as a public art piece as mm -hmm. it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah. May I answer even though the question was <laughs> No, because in my, in, my, in my thesis, my first chapter was on Rafael Lozano Hammer's work, but frequency and volume where the body became an antenna, so then it would find, the body would move back and forth, and that would increase or decrease the volume within the space, and then left to right. The body would move left to right, and then they would ca you would capture a radio station or a frequency, and um, so in, in to answer your question. Oh, and then the second chapter was on John Craig Freeman's work, who used augmented reality to tell the stories of. Um, well, in this case, I looked at uh, Border Las Fronteras, mm -hmm. and so you know you put your you put your phone or mobile device over the you know the border between Arizona and you know Mexico, and then you see these calacas or these skeletons appear on your phone and the closer you are to a Calacas, you're literally quite standing where someone would pass away trying to cross the border. So to answer your question, it's not about the audience being subversive, it's about the artist being subversive. Mm -hmm. And in some cases, using the technology that's meant for a specific maybe commercial use and then you know, um, and, and saying, no, I'm gonna I'm not gonna show you logos, I'm not gonna show you where this milk comes from, you know, because you can look on a milk cart and hold your phone and you can see cows frolicking somewhere and that's what a lot of, um, you know, um, companies do augmented reality for, but John Kirk Freeman didn't do that. He, he was telling these stories. I mean, if you go to the Foxconn building, he has another piece where you put your mobile device over the Foxconn building and you see bodies falling and they're representative of the, the people that have committed suicide from being mm -hmm. overworked, ironically making a phone. Mm -hmm. And so, and Misha Cardenas' work is the same thing. It's, you know, it's, it's trying to take Second Life and, and, and virtuality and say, well, why can't I make a space uh, that, that opens up how we even look at, you know, bodies outside of the masculine and feminine. Mm -hmm. And sometimes their audience, you know, may not even know that it's a subversive act until they start really thinking about the work itself, mm -hmm. which I think is the power of the three artists in the particular works that I looked at. Mm -hmm. But it's a good question. With the, the Aravanga Jones and Associates project that, that mm -hmm. I mentioned, um, I was reading an article about um, uh, someone re re relaying their experience, their, their first experience with the project and coming upon it and seeing um, a group of protesters appropriate the structure as a way to amplify their voice uh, because it's not only you know, sending these transmissions that are being picked up if someone chooses to do so, but then it also has this audio component that's literally like um, amplifying their voice. So I think in that way, a public could um, could appropriate those structures too. Um, and but I don't know. I guess the the question then becomes whether they see it as a form of art. Like, yeah. Um, you had a question. Yeah, so Sorry. I had a, a, two questions. You talked about copyright issues, but are there any uh, intellectual domain issues that kind of comes about, especially as you take the form of an interview, which is very personal to begin with, and they have their own contextual mm -hmm. sort of an environment within which, and, and then you take it out of that context, and then you present it as a public piece. So I think mm -hmm. I'm very curious about not just the copyright, but sort of the intellectual domain that mm -hmm. your work is transferred <coughs> to. And then the question for you would be, um, you, you take the billboard and you talk about tactical urbanism and then you kind of very subtly put these um, you know, generators and your processors which is not viewed to the public. So is that a reason why you leave that void in the urban space? Um, and how would you, you contend with, with the void that's just left there? But it's actually picking up a lot of uh, information from the environment that you are in, and it's really what tactical urbanism is kind of all about mm -hmm. conceptually. So, mm -hmm. um, As far as intellectual property and taking someone's words and changing them and uh, rearranging them, uh, that's a good question. Uh, it has like two maybe ways I can talk about them, one is like a legal question, one is a conceptual question. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with, the, start with the legal question. Um, uh, the, uh, to protect like freedom of speech of artists, there is uh, something called uh, 
um, uh, fair use. Mm -hmm. And so fair use says that uh, if you can use words of culture, works of cultural production, we actually do it all the time, it's impossible for artists nowadays not to refer to culture that's going on around them. In, in a way, it's their duty. So the, uh, this law protects uh, artists that they can do it and that they can speak and express their opinion. Um, but they, the, it's restricted in some ways. Mm -hmm. Like if you're doing it for purposes of uh, cultural criticism, not for profit. So uh, it, it's it, there are rules that allow artists to uh, make this sort of uh, this sort of adjustments. Uh, and it's even necessary that there will be people that do this sort of adjustment. And as far as the conceptual question, uh, when I first showed this work uh, in my critique at my school, uh, one of the people at the panel got very upset. It happens once in a while people get upset uh, when you make political work. And, um, and he said that it's, uh, that, uh, it's, it's an amoral work because I'm taking someone's voice and uh, I'm cutting it and putting it together and saying my own things and I'm manipulating someone into saying what I want them to say, like a puppet. But isn't that something that's inherent already to the act of editing? I'm only making it transparent. What already exists in the original footage? Already someone put this interview together, had their intention or message that they wanted to give. I'm only making it even more transparent. So. Uh, so no, I, I don't think it's an amoral thing to do, and um, and I also think that the message of the work is important enough that it should be heard and that it should be somehow protected under uh, a law that uh, allows this sort of cultural reference. Oh, did you want to answer that question? <laughs> <laughs> So, okay, so I understood your question to be um, about uh, the, the void that we created with our, uh, with a, the absence of um, any kind of signage, um, but the insertion of a, uh, a unit that, that uh, generates. Um, and so uh, I'm, I'm thinking about, and I'm trying to remember the name of one of the presenters this morning. Um, uh, it was... Uh, uh, it was the uh, Nabia uh, Chodhare's uh, uh, description of um, an essay as an attempt, as an effort, as an attempt to re receive or revive a voice. And I thought that was really beautiful when she said that, and it really, it really stuck with me. Um, and. I think the reason that it does is that this is something I'm kind of playing with in, in my head right now. Um, and I think that Jessamine Lovell and I were kind of doing this as well. That we wanted um, the Lomas system, the Lomas on-site listening system station to essentially just be an act of hope. Just more of, of again, just uh, listening even. Uh, not necessarily to to say something specifically, right? We didn't want to be inserting a specific message, something very clear, but instead um, instead of putting something into the site that's clearly uh, changing it, what, I mean, there, we felt like there was already something there. There's already a public there. There's already like a community and a site there. We found people, because we had, we had been talking about maybe setting up a stage or doing all these different things, and then we found that, you know, people actually live here. Um, and maybe they're not visible during the day, but they are here. Um, that this, this site has its own community. It has its own potential. And so instead of trying to, um, I think, put something that, that we see as this is what the site is, we wanted to learn more about it. And so this was our way of, of doing that, of just listening. Thank you. It kind of builds into this whole notion of straddling the in-between space Mm -hmm. and, and, and so, you know, it, and, and that's what I was trying to get at. Are you intentionally leaving it there and just picking up, you know, things that are important to the community? And especially because it's so ephemeral, you know, and you're not recording or archiving anything. So I think there's a whole debate around that that, that could be really interesting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Well, yeah, and it, it's also hyper-local. I mean, it only broadcasts for a few thousand feet. So it's if you're driving by on this, this you know, very heavily traveled road where you're going maybe 40 miles an hour, you'll go in and out of it just really quick, right? And it'll go from static to the station to static quite promptly. And again, you have to kind of sit and, 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 and look for it, look to receive it. May I just ask a clarifying question? So when, when you pass by the project, you can hear, the, you can hear, you said it's ambient sounds, so then mm -hmm. you can actually stand there and then hear. If you, had a, if you had a radio, um, like, a, like a handheld Got radio it. or a radio in your car, you would be able to hear it. There's no um, speakers or anything that's amplifying it. It's all FM transmission. So, so when you're there, um, it's outside of your sense perceptions. You, you might not recognize it. You definitely see that there was something weird in that sign. What is that strange <laughs> object, right? But yeah. um, maybe its intentions wouldn't be known. Oh, that's interesting. I just only because a few oh, or was a couple of years ago I, I saw David Lyon speak about surveillance mm -hmm. at theorizing the web, and he said something really interesting that I just took away. And I think it kind of there's a thoroughway with all of our projects about surveillance, even though people have a really contentious relationship with the idea of the world, that it could also be. And this was a real kind of thought experiment. He said surveillance can also be um, care for others meaning mm -hmm. you're listening mm -hmm. for something, you're yeah. waiting for something. And so yeah. it's just, we should talk because I, I feel like there's, <laughs> a, there's so many radio projects that are out there and you know, um, that have that kind of notion of, um, it's not just engagement, but you're listening to things that you've never heard before because yeah. someone is, the artist is putting it forth to you. Mm -hmm. And so it's just very yeah. similar to your work. Um, Thank you all. <laughs> Thank you all and we'll, obviously we'll still be here. <laughs> <laughs>